Oklahoma needs a new offensive play caller. Now with Seth Luttrell being shown the door after a disaster of a 2024 start, what direction do the Sooners turn this offseason? And can the offense be salvageable just for bowl eligibility this upcoming fall? Welcome on into SEC Unfiltered. It's Cole Thompson here. Make sure that you like the video. Hit that ring notification down below. And of course, smash that subscribe button because we're talking college football every single day on this channel. Download the podcast version of the show wherever you get your podcast listening systems. Make sure you're following us on the socials, TikTok. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we're everywhere at SEC Unfiltered. If you want the back and forth banner to go along with me, it's at Mr. Cole Thompson on Twitter and Instagram. And check out all of our great work found at secunfiltered.com. This episode is brought to you by our friends over at Roback. Look good, feel good this upcoming fall on game day at roback.com. When you use that promo code SECU for 20% off all pullovers, shorts, hoodies, jackets, much, much more. You want to be dressed the night on game days. You want to take those nice fall foliage pictures with your significant other. Do so, roback.com, promo code SECU. So Seth Luttrell is out of a job, obviously. It was dead on arrival well before this matchup on Saturday afternoon in the homecoming game for Oklahoma to where fans with 45 minutes left on the clock could have turned the other game on and probably enjoyed a little bit of solstice. Uh, we saw the signs early on against Tennessee. We saw the signs naturally in the matchup against Houston. We definitely saw it against a team like Texas in the Red River shootout, and it boiled on over against South Carolina. Let me just tell you how the opening script went after South Carolina came, feasted, played pissed off, and made sure that Oklahoma could just sit there with their jaws open going, it can't get much worse. Oh, but it can. Nikki Manwari on the opening play takes back an interception, and five plays later, they're up 7 0. Less than six plays later, it's 14 0 because Tonka Hemingway, who probably is named after the big Tonka truck, is running it back 64 yards after a strip sack. And just for good insult to injury, um, Michael Hawkins Jr. throws another interception. To who else but Nikki Manwari, who wasn't satisfied with going down, so he takes it back for an easy pick six. And now it's 21 0 with still nine minutes left in the first quarter, and the game is already done. Yeah, there was nothing else that we could say at this point. It was already complete. And now they turn to Jackson Arnold, who basically was like putting a band aid on a wound that needs stitches. It can get you to the hospital, but if you think that that's the only thing that's going to save you, you're already dead on arrival. So that was the case. Um, nine sacks allowed in this game, it's the most by an Oklahoma team. In a game? No, 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 no. Not nine sacks in, in a season. Not nine sacks by Brett Medal ever. The most in a game. And what was really an insult to injury, and, and for me, probably the biggest slap in the face if I am Shane Beamer, I have tight ends blocking Dylan Stewart and Kyle Kennard. Tight ends. And by the way, not tight ends that are known as blocking tight ends, because there is a difference. Uh, tight ends that are meant for being receivers. Yeah, I was going to be playing pissed off too. And they did. And they feasted. And basically the way that they looked when they had to play against Ole Miss a few weeks ago, that was how South Carolina played against Oklahoma. So set the trails out of a job. Um, there's going to be people out there. You know who they are. I know who they are. That will say, well, look at the offensive line and where it was this year. Look at the wide receiver core and where it was this year. Look at how many injuries were stockpiling up. Yeah, I don't want to hear it. The way this offense has looked, they haven't scored a touchdown until the third quarter since week five offensively, and that was against an Auburn team where you need a pick six to get a win. They are dreadful at running the football. The only thing that they really are positive at is avoiding penalties. There was no salvaging this. And yes, I get it. Seth Luttrell, beloved Sooner, a guy that we need to talk about in a prominent light for what he did underneath Bob Stoops. But this is the SEC where literally we have seen head coaches fired for less in the past. Don't believe me? Ed Orgeron would like a word. This is not a correctable offense for 2024 in terms of getting to the high tempo overall persona of the RPO that you thought was going to be envisioned when Jackson Arnold was taking reps or when Michael Hawkins was taking reps. It's not. I have to throw this up here, a quick PSA so the FCC doesn't find us. Children, shield your eyes because the offensive numbers I'm about to read you will probably put you in a blender of concern. 
Oklahoma ranks 105th in fourth down conversions, 107th in scoring, 128th in total yards per game. They're 116th in rushing, 114th in passing, 115th in total first downs, 128th in tackles for losses allowed, 128th in third down conversion ratio, 133rd in explosive plays, and 133rd in sacks allowed with 29 through seven games. They are ranked inside the top 100 in two categories, penalties and turnover margin. And neither one of them say that that's a good team. What that says is that they're a team that avoids putting themselves even further in damage. They're not digging the grave. And just for the ultimate cherry on top of the crap cake that currently resides out in Norman, Oklahoma, Jackson Darnold had more passing yards than the Norris Sellers. They averaged roughly about the same yards per attempt. Uh, the offense finished better on third down conversions. They held the ball actually longer. On top of that, they rushed for the same amount of yards per attempt at 4.1. And they had better fourth down conversion attempts with one out of five. So the offense of Oklahoma actually looked better than the offense of South Carolina, yet you never would know because if you just look at the scoreboard being down 21 nothing, you didn't have to know how the rest of the story was going to unfold. So that's what this is. Now comes the hard part about where do you turn? Joe John Finley and Kevin Johns are going to come on in and they're going to serve as the play callers. Joe John Finley is going to be the new number one and basically Kevin Johns has got an internal promotion overnight. So how do you build whatever works around Jackson Arnold? And I'm saying Jackson Arnold because at this point, when you burn his red shirt, he is now your guy. And what you have to look for in these next five games is will he be your guy for 2025? Do you have enough belief that he will turn the corner, do enough for you offensively, show you the qualifications that you want in a starting quarterback and not look at the numbers, not look at the yards per game, but look at the consistency, the maturation, and the growth of the player. He is good enough to be here in 2025. Because I'm going to tell you right now, uh, Brett Venables will be here in 2025. So how do you build an offense that also caters to the strength of Jackson Arnold? Your offensive line is what it is. I'm tired of hearing about the laundry list, the CVS receipt of what is the, uh, the wide receiver injuries. They are what they are at this point. You got to roll with the punches. This is the SEC. Wake up and choose violence or go ahead and sit on out and don't complain about it later on. That's what you got. Okay, glad. Now we're on the same page. You have to build an offense that can cater towards Jackson Arnold's strength. Quick passes. Delivery across the middle of the field, building that relationship with the tight ends, trusting the run game. Having a good run game when the quarterback position is somewhat questionable sometimes benefits you. Go look back at Kevin Johns when he was the offensive play caller for Duke last year. They finished with 26 rushing touchdowns. They were top 50 in rushing offense, and they were exceptional on third down explosive plays with the rushing attack. And you have running backs. You do. Taylor Tatum, Javante Barnes. You feel really confident when he's out there in Gavin Sawchuck. So there's a lot to like about the running back position when it's fully healthy, but it's got to get there. You have to lean into the ground game. You have to lean into the quick strikes, into the up-tempo passing. That is what's going to work for Joe John Finley, and that's what's going to work for this Oklahoma team. The other part is, at this moment, you're not looking to get to, to, get to national college football playoff relevancy. You're looking to get to seven wins. And the reason I say seven is because of there are many people that work in the national industry that say you are a six-win team. And wouldn't it just be funny to once again kind of rub their noses in it and say, you have no idea what you're talking about when it comes to Sooner football. Our defense is elite. Our offense got better because we fired one of the major problems. Not the only problem, but one of the major problems. And look at us now. We're competing for a seventh victory going into Baton Rouge. I don't know where that seventh win comes from. I don't know where that sixth win comes from. You can probably chalk up Maine as a victory, but now you got to look at the next four games. What do you look like against Ole Miss this weekend? What do you look like when you take on Alabama? What do you look like when you travel to Como to take on Mizzou? Because if those are games where it doesn't feel like it's out of reach, but if you don't have a good offensive identity or an offensive identity at all, not even a good one, just one that is existing, you are basically already halfway from digging your grave. In fact, you already are digging the grave. The question is how quickly will the dirt be protruded on you before you lose the oxygen and go up and spend time with the college football gods. Regardless, the offensive identity that will be built around Jackson Arnold has to be poignant. Now, we also got to talk about what direction does Brett Venables go in 2025 for his offensive coordinator. I won't spend a lot of time on this. We'll come up with a video with more names to be paying attention to. But for me right now, Brennan Marion, the U uh, UNLV OC, has got to be your first phone call. He runs a go-go offense. You need to stop, stop if you're turning your attention anywhere else. 
this is an offense right now that has playoff implications on the line, especially with their matchup this weekend against Boise State. On top of that, they also rank top five in rushing. They also rank top five in explosive plays, top five in scoring. You rank 100 and something in everywhere else. So it's not like this is not a good game plan. The season is lost in terms of turning this offense into anything other than just a crap cake that can be protruded as at least something edible. That's all you're looking for at this point. But can it be fixed enough to get you to bowl eligibility? Can it be fixed enough to put you in a good situation? Because the wagons are off the wheels and Seth Luttrell was fired because Brett Venables want to save face and show he was the right answer for the folks out in Norman. Basically, it was like having a venomous snake bite and you cut off the leg because if you'd rather save the rest of the body and let the limb just die on its own, that's what it felt like we're cutting off Seth Luttrell. More problems ahead, but that's not, you have to worry about what you can right here and right now. I think that Oklahoma can still get to seven wins. I do. They got to play exceptional football down the stretch and they have to basically show up offensively, but I do believe it's possible. The next hire, the one that's made this offseason, that would be the one that either makes or breaks Brent Venable's tenure in Norman. And right now, I don't know what is the best course of action to go with. You have more problems to figure out. And probably the most important one, do you have the quarterback that can be sufficient even when everything is already out of reach. But let me know in the comment section down below, what are your overall thoughts on Oklahoma getting rid of Seth Luttrell at this point? What are your overall thoughts about the direction of Oklahoma moving forward? Make sure that you download the podcast version of the show. Like, rate, review, subscribe. Follow us on the social channels, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Follow me at Mr. Cole Thompson and check out all of our great work found at secunfiltered.com. Until next time, folks, I am Cole Thompson. Boomer Sumer Nation, I promise you, it will get better. Peace. (laughs) 